It's time to break up with your inner critic and find your caregiver. I'm partnering with Green Mountain at Fox Run to host the first ever Be Her Now Body Kindness Weekend just for women. Join me Thursday, June 1st through Sunday, June 4th for a weekend of love, fun, and self-care. You'll experience Green Mountain's world-renowned program and brand new body kindness spiral up activities all in the natural beauty of Vermont. Let's take the time to work on ourselves, heal with others, and get inspired to create a better life. Learn more at fitwoman.com slash body kindness. Hey guys, it's Rebecca. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening today. I think you are going to love this conversation. I know I certainly did. Just wanted to give you a heads up before we continue on. You may want to grab a set of headphones if you're around kids or in a place where you might not want to hear any adult language. There are a couple little adult words (laughs) in this conversation with myself and author, yogi, body positive, shiro of mine, Jessamine Stanley. I am so excited to bring you this wonderful conversation about the intersections of yoga and body image and well-being. And we really elevated the conversation. And I particularly enjoyed her insights. Her book is wonderful. It had me laughing out loud in several parts. I do read from the book a little bit in our conversation, but it is one, if you don't already have it, you're going to want to run to your nearest bookstore or wherever books are sold and pick it up. And so I really hope you enjoy our conversation and dialogue. And even if you're someone that has tried yoga. Jessamine talks about how she's tried it several times before she really found it. And if you've read Body Kindness, you also know that it was very fundamental for me and improving my health and well-being. I did yoga exclusively actually for five years to really help myself heal inside and out. And it really taught me self-compassion, non-judgment. And she even inspired me to do something different with yoga in my life. And I really do agree with her and the title of her book that yoga is for everybody. So enjoy the show. Because real health is about being good to yourself. It's time for body kindness, the place where all bodies fit and weight is just a number. Hi, I'm Rebecca Scritchfield, author of the book, Body Kindness, registered dietitian, nutritionist, and host of this podcast. My topic today is yoga and body image. And my special guest to discuss this today is Jessamine Stanley. She's the author of Everybody Yoga, as well as an intentionally recognized yoga teacher and award-winning Instagram star at My Name is Jessamine. And she's a body positive advocate. She has been profiled by a wide range of media, including Good Morning America, Time, New York, Glamour, Shape, People, Essence, Lenny Letter, and many others. When she's not on the road teaching, she lives in Durham, North Carolina. Welcome to the show, Jessamine. It's so nice to be here, Rebecca. I'm like, oh, those things are me? Those things that I did? What? (laughs) Who are we talking about? (laughs) I'm just, I don't know. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's that like sort of pinch me please moment. But you know, you you definitely are an icon to be admired no. by everyone. <laughs> no. <laughs> Absolutely not. Well, (laughs) you really need no introduction. I can't wait to share some of my favorite videos I've seen of you and interviews. I mean, you were just doing such amazing and important work really on encouraging everybody, I believe, to create a better life. And your vehicle is through yoga and self, hopefully self-love, but if not self-love, self-appreciation or acceptance or at least neutrality, (laughs) you know, be here. At the very least, just get into a place where you're not saying like, I hate myself every day. It's really more often than not the case. And I think that while, yes, you know, be comfortable in your size, be comfortable with your height, be comfortable with your skin color, your natural hair, whatever it is, but really also just just try to get to a place where you don't hate yourself and where you can foster love. Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'll even tell people, 
if you're, you know, the goal is to get comfortable. And if you're having a moment where you're uncomfortable, like you can let yourself feel that negative emotion. You can let yourself feel that discomfort, but just notice it, right? We do a lot of noticing in yoga and you notice that like, I'm uncomfortable in this moment, but I'm still the kind of person who wants to take care of herself, you know? And so I think if you can hold on to that, you know, that eventually gets to comfort, but you know. Exactly. And I think also that discomfort is a part of comfort, that in order to understand the positive, you have to have the negative. And it's very easy for us because we live in a society where we are constantly adjusting things to where we want to be. It's really difficult for us to comprehend that some things are just supposed to suck. They're supposed to, because it makes you stronger and it makes you appreciate when they don't suck. So if you, and the pro, I feel like yoga, Yoga is always just reminding me to appreciate that balance and to invite that balance in and to not run and cower whenever I'm in a difficult situation. What if that may be? It's everything from to not not having road rage to remembering to love the people who are most difficult for me to comprehend. And those opportunities to look for the balance, that's really what it's all about. Yeah. I love you saying some things are supposed to suck. I mean, that is awesome. <laughs> you know, because it's funny, like I often struggle with when people like specifically with exercise and they'll say something like, this is hard or, you know, like there's something about it I don't like. And again, you know, we can acknowledge that, yes, there might be something about it you don't like or, or yeah, this is hard. But to me, when I hear this is hard, I often hear I can't do it. And so it becomes this more beating yourself up as opposed to a reframe of this is challenging, but challenges, like you said, lead to growth. Exactly. Well, and I feel like because I'd spent so much of my life, like, like as a fat body person, you're really taught that you're not supposed to do certain kinds, certain things, and that you are supposed to do like gradual kinds of exercises, like beginner style, gentle things. And I just really feel like if you say, because the reason being that like, essentially you won't be able to do it if it's hard or if it's complex. And the reality is that anyone can do anything that they put their mind to. And I feel like it's very important to remember that when you're learning something, it's not going to be easy. Like it's not, if you don't know how to do something, it doesn't make sense that it would be, that it would come naturally to you. And I feel like it's, it's fine to say that like in the same way that something is easy, something is hard. It's not, I feel like, and this goes into a larger theme, but words become more powerful than they need to be. And we associate, we have all these connotations that go along with them. And again, this extends into so many other areas, but like, I just feel like if you can say, you know, like it's hard. Yeah. And I'm gonna try, you know, I might fail. I might fuck up. Like I might not do it. I might not make it. I might fall. It might be embarrassing, but the embarrassing is just thinking about how your reaction is being seen by somebody else. So if you can stop thinking about how someone else feels about it, then all it is is hard again. And it's just supposed to be hard, but it's, it's hard to get to, (laughs) it's hard to get to that place of thinking about it too. I mean, it's funny that you say, so I did yoga exclusively for five years and I credit it to healing my body image. I feel like yoga was the place where I learned to sit with discomfort. And the teacher would, you know, trust your breath, focus on your breath, just sit with this discomfort and breathe into it. And it wasn't pushed further. It was just be here and you don't need to run away from it. And you know what? That really is a distinct difference from the fitness industry too, as opposed to where it's saying like, this is hard. Go into it. Lean into it. And the thing is like, listen, I can get off on that too. I do not poo-poo the fitness industry, but I think it's really important for us to differentiate between fitness and yoga and that the difference is in what you're saying. It's like, yeah, so this is discomfort. This is sensation. Just sit with it. You know, just don't run from it. Just sit with it. No, just it's okay. Just sit with it. 
And that that little difference is it's big. It really is. It is huge. So let's actually back it up a second. And I'm I I would like you to share. Just tell us your yoga story. Yeah. Well, basically, I started practicing yoga when I was in graduate school. I was going through a period of depression, and I can go into all the reasons why this was happening. But I mean, I think that everyone has come to junctures in life. It was not the first time that it's happened to me. It is not the only time since. Like I haven't. It's not like that hasn't happened since then. But I think that everyone kind of comes to places in their life where you're at a crossroads, you're in conflict, you are not with yourself. And for me, it wasn't even necessarily my phobia. It was about the way that I was approaching my life. I felt very disconnected from those around me. This is also all in retrospect, after years of meditation and practice, this, this is the place I've come to about it. But at the time, I was just like, I hate everything. And I say this, I want to make this distinction because I think a lot of people come to the practice for physical reasons or being like, oh, I want to be or I want to lose weight or I want to get flexible or whatever it is. And it was never like that for me. I was just in a dark place. And one of my classmates was like, oh my God, I try yoga. You'll love it. It's going to change your life. And I told her straight up that I wasn't going to do that because I had actually tried yoga before. And I was like, and I really hated it. And I was like, I'm not doing this. And she just wore me down and I went and I loved it. It was extremely difficult. All of the asanas seemed completely impossible to me. Like it seemed like I just could not do it at all. And I would feel as though, you know, I was the largest person in the room. I felt like everyone was staring at me, but it me the space to really step outside of comfort zones that I'd made for myself. And it gave me the opportunity to be really like just accepting failure and giving myself the chance to fall down. And these were things that I was not doing in my day to day life. I was not engaged. I was not like trying to step out of a boundary. I was just, you know, wake up, go to class, go to work, have the same conversations, go to sleep, wake up, do it all over again. And it was so, I did not have a connection to anything. And it just gave me so much clarity and focus. But when I first started practicing, I was doing a work study at the studio that I went to. And I had to practice like four or five times a week. And I had to help clean the studios, but I could practice for free. But the pra- it gave me a lot of confidence. It I moved to Durham where I live now. And when I moved to Durham, there wasn't a work study option like that. And I didn't have the money to practice in yoga studios. One thing that we really forget about this is that the practice in the West is extraordinarily expensive and it's very much targeted to specific groups of people for that reason. And I was not in the group of people that they were targeting. And so for a while, I stopped practicing. And during that time, some um, sad things happened. My aunt passed away really unexpectedly. I talk about this in Everybody Yoga. I talk about all this in the book, but um, she passed away. And then um, also my grandma passed away shortly thereafter. And my then girlfriend's brother passed away. It was just a lot of things happening at the same time. And I found myself slipping back into that place of depression. And I thought, you know, what was making me feel good before yoga? Okay, I just got to figure out a way to do this again. And I started practicing at home and I would practice like the eight to 10 postures from the Bikram sequence that I felt pretty comfortable with and confident in. And I was looking at social media. This was back when Instagram was not nearly as popular as it is now. But like back then, it was just, you know, some very serious practitioners and teachers who were logging their practices and giving each other alignment tips. And I wanted to feel like I was part of a bigger community to have that connect. Because when you don't have a teacher watching you, you're thinking, you know, like, is my alignment right? Or like, am I doing this correctly? And so I would take the pictures so that I could log my progress. And when I look back at my Instagram and at all of my social media, I really just see a journal of the last few years of my life. And it's weird to me that other people can see that journal. And from there has grown so much that I had never anticipated. And as a teacher, like I had never aspired to be a yoga teacher. That was not one of my goals. I felt like um, there were maybe even too many yoga teachers. Like I was like, I would literally say people were asking me to come teach them from all over the world. And I would be like recommending other teachers. I would recommend other classes. And I taught like some of my friends here in Durham, but I was not trying to be a yoga teacher because I didn't understand why I needed to be a teacher. Because to me, at that point, the practice was a fairly superficial practice. Like it wasn't, in my mind, it was not. But in retrospect, it was very much like, these poses are amazing. They make me feel so great. 
I can see within myself in this really interesting way. And it's much deeper than the exercise, but it's just really, exercise is so great. But when I went to teacher training, which the whole saga of how that ended up happening, it's not in the book, but it's a whole separate topic. But um, when I went, I realized that the reason that there have to be so many yoga teachers is because we all have our own unique journeys and we all have our own, like a very distinct set of experiences. And while those experiences and that (laughs) style that's going to come along with that, it's not going to resonate for everyone. It might resonate for someone. And because we live in a really wild situation as human beings, where we are spiritual beings that are having this experience that is so not about the spirit like we everything that we create becomes bigger is within us and it's very important that we make space for ourselves and for other people to have a constant communion with what is happening within ourselves and with the energy that we're connecting to between one another and that concept because it is so opposite of how we are trained to think in this world, it was hard as fuck for me to get to this place of understanding it. It took really, like, my practice had to evolve, essentially. And at this point, I don't really feel like, I still don't really feel like I aspire to be, I think that my practice and my teaching practice exists because they were meant to exist. And that I'm not really, like, that obsessed with being a yoga teacher. I love teaching, but I don't think that to me it's not about a career or something it's more like this is something that I clearly need to spread to other people right now and then if I if it's time for me to stop doing that I will continue practicing yoga till the end but when it's time to stop doing this then I will so is that what made you want to write the kind of yoga book you wrote because it's it's very unique. Yeah. The reason that I wrote the book is because I have had so many people and I talk about this a little bit in the book, but I feel like I can go into more detail now. But I have had so many people over the years be like, oh my God, I'm probably getting an email about this right now. Someone saying, oh my God, Justin, I've always wanted to practice yoga. I see that you're doing it. You know, how did you do it? What do you do? Like, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm always thinking, how can I possibly answer this question in the level of detail? that you're looking for because while you think you're asking oh what do I need to buy in order to practice yoga what classes should I take like how did you get started doing this but what you're really asking is like how Jessamine did you get to a place of needing to do this practice and how do you actually incorporate it in your life on a day-to-day basis and that question is so much complicated that I don't Like, I don't answer the emails. I don't answer the comments. And I've just had like thousands of comments and emails stacking up. And I was like, fuck, man, I got to write a book where I just say all this and then I can say it once. And then if anybody asks me again, then I can just hand them the book. And it felt very important to me to tell about my own story because in the in our understanding of modern yoga, it's like the yoga teacher is supposed to be a mythical being. Like you disregard every bad thought that you've had, every misstep, every um, bump and bruise, and you are now reborn as the archangel of yoga. And it's just not, not like that. And I wanted to really tell the story of someone who has had conflict and contradiction and sadness and weirdness and who continues to have this because every single other person has that as well. Well, it's such a unique book. I want to encourage listeners to check it out. And, you know, it's interesting because it reads like a memoir with great, I mean, I was telling you before we chatted, I was laughing out loud and my daughters were like, what's so funny? And I had to try to find child two and four year old ways of explaining what I was reading about. And I just said, this is mommy's friend doing yoga. And they jumped on the bed and started doing yoga. So, you know, you've made it accessible to four year olds. Can I just tell you on that really briefly, last night at my signing, there was this little boy, the last question I answered, this little hand pops up in the back and it's this little blonde boy. And he's like, so are there any yoga poses that you think are really hard? And I was like, yeah, dude, like all of them are hard, blah, blah. And then when he went through the signing line, he was telling Telling me about the poses that he felt really hard for him. He practices yoga at school, apparently. And we just had, like, we took a selfie together. We had this great interaction. And I was like, so, like, 
this, I mean, I'm, he can't have been more than like second grade. I'm like, me in this elementary school, like little white boy, we're connecting like this about yoga. Like, this is why I'm here. This is awesome. That is so, so cool. No, that's a great story. And there's something, I, there's something just magical about kids, right? I mean, just believing in the future, like maybe life won't suck for them as bad. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Build the world. Yeah. And break the chains and pass it on and all that stuff. I mean, so speaking of the past and this book, oh, well, wait, before I get into that, I wanted to just let listeners know that with the way that it's organized. So when you go through these stories, then you say, hey, if this is something you're struggling with, here are some poses that may help, or here is some asana that I like to do when I'm dealing with this. And that is just so unique and so brilliant. Like once you taught the ABCs, you kind of go through and you pair what might be going on with life to a yoga practice you can do. And I just, however you thought of that, like that is the best juju ever. That was so good. It's really funny though. Cause like I just wrote it the way that I learned it. Like the way that I learned it was literally just integrating these postures into my practice because I had not practiced poses like downward facing dog. I had not practiced, um, I mean, even like Uttanasana standing forward fold. And be, even though I'd practiced Bikram yoga for quite some time, those postures that are standard in vinyasa yoga and in so many other styles were not familiar to me. And so I would just work on them individually and then I would work on them in flows. And and then eventually I just got to a place of being able to flow with it. And I was like, I mean, this is how you learn. I think that sometimes it can be really intimidating when you just get it like all in one go. So I'm glad that that made sense. Okay. So my little secret is whenever I get a new book, I go to the back and read the acknowledgements first. <laughs> in yours, you thanked your high school bullies. Yes. So I'm a little curious about that, if you'd be willing to share a little something there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was really badly bullied, particularly in middle school. That's actually, I went to an all-girls boarding school for high school. And the reason that I went there is because I was so horrified by the idea of going to high school with the same people that I went to middle school with. And I mean, I don't come from a family with money. I had to like apply for a scholarship. It was a whole thing. And it was because of those experiences. And when I look back on that, I'm so grateful because really, if you learn at a young age that people can suck, you will just know that for your whole life. And then later in life, when you have people on the internet trying to troll you or talk shit about you or like say the meanest thing that they can come up with, it will be completely irrelevant. <laughs> and that is why I'm so grateful for these people who, I mean, cause they used to make fun of me for having ashy skin. I had, when I was in elementary school, I had locked hair. And then, and I talk about that in the book. And when I was in middle school, I had braided hair and they would call me Medusa. Like I, um, of course, they made fun of me for being fat, for having, um, my family didn't have a lot of money, so I was always wearing clothes that had holes in them. Like everything that you can think of to make, because kids suck, like because you're so self-conscious about yourself. And that's really what I learned is that everyone is so hell-bent on looking the same. And when you see someone who does not look the same, it jars your understanding of reality. And that I think is probably like why it's especially important to emphasize these things with children because they learn it at young age. You learn it from your parents. You see how they talk to people and then you bring that to school. And then, you know, I went during the time of like Jennifer Love Hewitt and Kirsten Dunst. I talk about her a lot in the book, like this very idealized idea of blonde, white beauty. And I grew up in a predominantly white community. And so it was very difficult for me as like as a black femme looking completely different than everyone else. It was very difficult for me to find a footing and it was helpful to, it wasn't helpful at the time. And that I feel like it's important to note that like this sucked at the time. This is why I am prone to depression. Like I am, or like this, these were my earliest experiences with depression. I was, I don't want to talk about this, but I was a self mutilator. Like it was not a good time. And I understand that for people who are going through it, it feels like you're in the eye of a hurricane and there's no one, even people will tell you, like I'm, I'm saying right now, like I'm on the other side of it. I get it. People suck. It's, you know, whatever. But like when you're in it, it's just like, there's no way to see outside of it. And that's why as problematic as it can be, I always felt like the It Gets Better campaign is so amazing because that idea of like, it gets better. It really does. Like it does get better because it's true. And I think that, um, 
had I not had those experiences, I would be so much more sensitive than I am. The event, I mean, because people, if you put pictures of yourself on the internet doing anything, like you could be feeding cows or like, you know, you could be Mother Teresa, like you could be out here like feeding and somebody will have some mean shit to say to you. And it's like, if you, I notice that a lot of people are very affected by what people say about them on the internet. Even people who are other prominent fat yoga people on Instagram, they will be very offended by things that people say. And like, they'll be in the comment section with these people. They'll be like crying about it on Snapchat. And like, I feel like I totally understand that. But that reaction is giving the people who are sad within themselves, it's giving them the reaction that they want. And I would not have been able to come to that place as easily as I did had I not had all those bad experiences before. So I can't help but be grateful for these people. Like all the boys who picked fun at me, thank you. Thank you. That is the ultimate goal of resilience and the picture of how can you get to the best place. And in positive psychology, it's called post-traumatic growth. And it's this idea that it's, you're not saying, oh yeah, the bullying was great. Thank you. (laughs) You're not saying that. But what you're saying is, is that I am this person that I never would have been had I not gone through this trauma. And, and yeah. And just as people can develop post-traumatic stress disorder, they can also uh, develop post-traumatic growth. And I think it is important for people to hear that because like you say many times in the book, we all have our own shit. Don't act like you don't have shit going on. (laughs) And I think it's another, it's just another fabulous way that you're a role model outside of appearance, you know, which is very, very important. And I'm going to get to that. I hope you don't mind me meeting a a tiny little blurb, some little blurbs here, but this, I was like, yeah, girl, we have got to talk about this. So let me see. Basically, you say, but if you're only paying to the media's only paying attention to the media's idea of a yoga practitioner, one that mirrors the stereotypical image of physician approved Western health, slender, long and young, it's easy to see how you might feel a little alienated and lost. You know, when I go on social media and I see these ads, I always say it's offensive and Facebook ignores me, but I still call it offensive. Like these Exactly what you're saying here, but even like things like yoga shred or like these photoshopped images where they literally took away ribs and added, you know, curves or, you know, like basically this muscle with no body fat. I think, you know, the idea, the image and like there was someone who was going down in Chaturanga on her fists and I'm like, (laughs) and I'm looking at this saying, this is not real yoga. You know, this is not what yoga is about. And I know that you've touched on that, but like, just kind of share with me a little insight for people who are seeing that stuff, like that this is not real and that they're trying to make money off you. Don't do that. Exactly. That's all it is. They're just trying to make money off of you, which I mean, we live in a capitalist society. It is what it is. Like, I'm not going to get into the mechanics of who should be doing what and what should be happening. But the reality is that that's not yoga. And when I see that, all I think is that's something. It's not yoga, but that's something, you know, and I tend to not get too wrapped up in it only because when I I mean, especially when it's something like yoga shred or whatever, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, you're trying to attract people who have been taught that they need to hate their bodies and they need to aspire to a very specific standard of beauty that was created to sell things. And I think that what we can do as people who are, you know, trying to be critical of the world that we live in and trying to see, see for better, see for positive, see for, you know, just trying to create a new reality that those things, they only have power or only have worth or only relevant so much as we acknowledge them and just don't acknowledge it. If you don't like it, don't acknowledge it. And I wish that more people would do that about things. Like if it's like, if you see something that's just like, man, that's not right. Then it's like, just don't, it just doesn't exist then. And I think that if you really want to practice, if you want to get into it and you've seen like maybe a picture of somebody who looked kind of different and then you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do it. And then you see yoga shred and you're like, but can I do it? Just think, 
yoga shred, that's not for you. That's for somebody else who needs, you know, but just don't because, and this isn't even just about yoga, but it's about like all, it's about a lot of kinds of fitness things too, because they are really created in this like cisgender, heterosexual, white male perspective, which is very much about like change your body so that I will want to fuck you. Like that's all it is. It's like change your body so that I'll want to have sex with you. You are an object for me and sex is for something for me to enjoy. Not even you. Like I don't care if you get anything out of this, but it's about you making yourself look different for me. Exactly. And when you see that, and that's that's what it is. You know, like that's why they make it that way. Then you just don't be a part of that. No, I love that. Like not for me. I sometimes I'll talk to clients about think of it like a bus. It's another idea is going to come along in fifteen minutes, and that one might be for you, <laughs> but you're not going to take this bus. That's such a good way to put that. It, the bus. I'm gonna try not to steal it, but I might. Oh, you totally should. You know, it's everything old is new again. Okay, so I have another quote from the book that I loved. Well, okay, for every maladjusted human being walking around on this planet, regardless of gender expression, there's a story just like mine. The details may vary, but the themes are basically the same. A cornucopia of self-imposed and society-endorsed body issues with a barrage of unhealthy coping mechanisms sprinkled liberally on top. So... I was getting you and getting you. And when you ended it with a joke, I was like, oh, thank you for making me laugh about something that hurts so bad. <laughs> exactly. Because it's, oh, no, go ahead, please. I mean, it's just like, it, it sucks to recognize things about yourself that are not like great or that you've been hiding something from yourself forever. And every day I feel like things come up for me where I'm like, wow, this is I've been burying this. Wow. Okay. And there's such a tendency to want to lean toward negativity and wanting to be like, God, I'm just, I can't believe that I feel this way about myself, or I can't believe that I haven't been able to let this go. And if you can just have a sense of humor about it and be like, well, you know, I'm glad it came up now. I'm glad I thought about it. Like just finding that positive part. It's again, it is hard. I don't want to make it sound like, oh, my God, it's so easy. Just do this and it'll be so great. But committing to at least trying that angle first, it helps. Yeah, no, I agree. So in several parts of the book, you talk about your relationship to food. And especially soothing and numbing emotion, which I have a PhD in that, I feel like, as far as life experience. For you, has yoga helped you at all with eating patterns and being able to process emotion and kind of help in healing in some way from that like it did for me? Absolutely. Yoga has completely changed my relationship with food. And food and nutrition is such a sticky topic in the fat positivity world because it it all acceptance because it always comes down to, you know, well, like it shouldn't matter what someone is eating. And like, I do agree with that. I think that we need to get off each other's plates, get out of each other's food. But an issue for me is that I never learned how to eat right. Like I always, I learned that, I mean, I came from a family where like we didn't have a lot of money. So when there was food, you ate a lot of it. And also growing up in the South, like we, you don't mince when it comes to the fat. And I feel like those two things combined, plus situations where it's just me and my brother at home, like eating together, trying not to be sad. That makes it so that you don't even really know when you're hungry. You just eat because there's food. And I carried that, have carried that my whole life. And in practicing yoga, you're constantly asking yourself, like, what do I need? What, who am I? Like, what's really going on here? So that now when I'm eating or when I'm selecting my food or when I'm like, it's really not even when I'm selecting the food, it's the because portion control was always a big problem for me and not even it's portion control from every angle. So it's like, no, if I'm restricting my diet, I have to only eat a small amount or no, if I'm, you know, feeling gluttonous and I just want to like, just let go, I'm just going to eat everything in sight. I can't leave anything on the plate. I never learned what it means to just, just eat till you're full. And then when you're, when you're done eating, you stop eating and you want to eat things that make you feel good. And that it's like, you know, just listening to intuitive eating has completely like shifted the everything for me. And, and I didn't come to it through therapy though. I think that that is, if you talking to someone about your food issues is so helpful. Like I think the work that nutritionists do is so important because it's some of us just like literally don't know what 
to do. It's like, what what's up here? And when you are trying to um, just determine like what should be going into my body, I think it's really helpful to just actually listen to what your body is saying, because your body will tell you that it wants water. It will tell you that it wants leafy greens. It'll tell you that it wants fruit that it wants protein. And actually listening to my body is something that I was not doing prior to yoga. And this is listening to it, how it cranks around in the asana, and then also how I approach the things that go into it. So, and then on top of that, having a, an asana practice that was like very, you know, like I'm working on advanced poses, you know, like I'm more, cause I wouldn't, I definitely have had like more than one macho phase in my asana practice. And I th- I'm not immune to that. And during, especially during these times, it's like, you're thinking about the things that you eat because your body is going to feel differently, move differently, depending on how much and what you put into it. And it's, all of these things have just really helped me to, because it's not about how much I weigh. You notice we talked about food, I didn't say anything about weight. It's about just how do I feel? Like I want to feel good. And there's a lot of different ways to feel good. No, it's such powerful information. I still, in my work and with the body kindness readers, they're still very much working on the self-compassion and self-acceptance part. They're, they are letting go of diet culture, but they're very afraid that they're not going to be able to trust their bodies. And for me, yoga was the movement that taught me to want to take care of my body. And like you said, connect and listen, everything you said. And when I got that, it allowed me to frame food as in something that I could enjoy and it, it about what I wanted to add in as opposed to what I needed to avoid. And so it really helped me flip food. And what's so interesting about all of it is that, and then, you know, becoming a dietitian with the word die and diet in the name, which I hate. <laughs> and interestingly, as I become a dietitian, because I want to help people lose weight, because I thought that's what everyone wanted. And I had to have my own diet rock bottom and all that stuff. But the point is, I was doing yoga, things were clicking. And when I could flip it in my mind, I had to do so much reframing of the purpose of food. Like it can be nourishment, it can be pleasure, and it can be pleasure from carrots and hummus because yeah, you know, veggies are good, but this also tastes good. And I'm not doing that because if it's my Weight Watcher point, you know, and so (laughs) I love your Weight Watcher story, by the way, I'm not, I'm not reading from that because that is gonna, I mean, there's so many good things in the book, but that I just love. And I was like, you go girl. But, but yeah, I mean, so I'm glad we're talking about this point though, because I agree with you. I'm new to the body positivity space. And, you know, as far as, you know, my name showing up and truthfully, I feel a sh- myself a strong ally to people in large bodies and reclaiming the word fat. And I do believe that we need to be talking about fat acceptance and not just, oh, well, body positive to a point, you know, and what I personally struggle with, I don't want to shove nutrition down people's throats. What I'm starting to see is this weird, almost like a different type of oppression. Like in order to stay body positive, you can't learn about nourishment in your body. You know, you know what I'm saying? I do. And that's something that so I first came to body positivity, fat acceptance and fat positivity when I came to it, like on live journal, on Tumblr, like before the image thing was so big and before it started to grow. And I remember thinking back then, I wish that there were more body pos people who would just talk about how like they're cool with like would talk about food more because we have this weird thing where it's like if you're fat you're either eating at McDonald's all the time or you're like showing everyone the salads that you make for yourself because you want to show that like you're not eating at McDonald's all the time and it's like we just make eating fine again it's like you know it doesn't matter what you eat and you whatever and there doesn't have to be a distinct emphasis on any one style of food because that's how we can get rid of all of this and even working in this kind of space it's very like it is a very it's a lightning rod topic because everyone has a personal like a a strong emotional tie to some aspect of it whether it's like coming from you are fresh from diet culture you are not 
even you can't even talk about any way of understanding food other than like purely just do whatever you want. And I think that beyond body politics, there's the fact that humans need to eat certain things to make their bodies run well. And that's where we need to focus the conversation. And this is a conversation that is also much bigger. It's about where our food comes from, who has access to it, and like, how can we make it so that everyone has access to food that is good for them? But instead, we're hung up on this part about like, you know, how much should you be eating, and where, and when, and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, just, we need to get past this part, because there's, and this is also why I think that even though, so body positivity came out of fat positivity and came out of fat acceptance, but to me, body positivity is very, very different and fat acceptance and fat positivity are their own thing. And I think that while both worlds are important, body positivity is like, and I think fat positivity and fat acceptance should include the things that we eat as well. Like that conversation has to be tied in. Yeah, no, that is going to be a, A, I agree. That is going to be a big to be continued conversation because I've, I've been noodling on it, kind of sharing it with some people and kind of like, you know, because I want to seek to understand more. And that's kind of what I'm getting at is that it's so intertwined with diet culture, what we eat, and especially now today's diets in disguise, like paleo and like whole 30, you know, it's like, those are, unnecessary, restrictive diets. Now, if someone doesn't, it's like, I swear my life's never been better. Like, I okay, I can't convince you that beans aren't going to kill you. Here's all the research. I can't convince you. And like, kind of like you said, you're not my person or that's not my thing. Like, that's kind of how I take it, you know, but it's just like, it's more of a curiosity of how do we address the fact that I would like all bodies to feel that when they choose, they can access neutral knowledge about food and choose to change their habits in a way around food that feel good to them, that help give them other things in life and not at all about appearance or not at all about virtue. You know, like we go through a jar of Nutella a week in my house. We love, you know, like exactly. (laughs) And that's the thing is that it's like, you can have all the things that you want. Just don't, as soon as you tip the scale one way or the other, then it's like, well, I can't eat this or I have to eat all of this or I can't eat that or I must eat this. And it's just like, just eat things that feel good to you until you're done eating them. Then exercise because exercising is something that humans are meant to do. Our bodies are meant to lunge. We're meant to run and do it because it feels good because it makes you feel happy and balanced. Not because somebody else told you that you have to in order to look a certain way or in order to have a certain worth because your self-worth is not tied up in in the things that you eat or what, how you exercise or anything like that. Amen. So we have a couple minutes left. I want to make sure we get to talking about why you encourage a home practice. Because I have a confession. I have never thought about doing a home practice. And I'm scratching my head when I'm reading your book. I'm like, duh, hello. <laughs> so talk to me about that. <laughs> it's very intimidating, I think. Like if you have always been able to go to classes and like it feels like a safe space and you have a teacher that speaks to you, if you a lot of people feel like, you know, they can't do it without other people there, that they can't motivate themselves or um, any number of reasons. Or like the thing that I hear most often is like, if I try to do it at home, I just won't do it. And I think that that all of that, I get it because I have always been the kind of person that like, I can't start a new thing at home because I will just stop doing it. Like if I start taking online classes or something, I'll just stop doing it. And I think the thing with yoga is that instead of thinking of it as an exercise thing that you have to do because you have to get in a certain amount of exercise, if you think of it as brushing your teeth or brushing your hair or just maintaining your, it's maintaining your spirit in the same way that you maintain your physical body, then it's really easy to be like, okay, so I just need to get like five minutes of this a day. Cool. I'm just going to roll my mat out. Even just and congratulate yourself for even the smallest things, just rolling the mat out. And then I like to even try to keep the mat rolled out so that you are more likely to step onto it. And then when you get on it, just focus on just trying to breathe, just breathe. That's your only goal is to breathe. And then once you are there and you're breathing, it's more likely that you'll want to like try some poses or you'll want to like 
be one pose. And I think that the idea is to build it very slowly and not obsess over it. And that's if you're starting from zero. I think that if you are like if you've practiced outside and you or outside of your home and you just want to start doing it at home, start with online classes and just subscribe to a studio where you have a lot of different options. I personally recommend Yoga Glow, Yoga G-L-O Glow. And I mean, I guess I should also plug my classes on Kodi app, C-O-D-Y-A-P-P. But I also just think that if you have somebody who teaches classes online that resonate for you, you do not have to go to live class. That means that you don't have to rely on going to the class because I think that obviously I teach live classes. I think they're awesome and amazing experience and so great. But I think that um, when we rely on the live class, it makes it difficult to really maintain the practice all the time and that you want to get to a place with it where it's not something that you only do when you have an extra $25 or when you have a free Saturday. It should be something that you do all the time. <laughs> you are so that you are even practicing when you're not physically practicing, that you're still working on your breath work, that you're still applying the themes that you learn during the asana practice into the other parts of your life. And I think that it's easier to just maintain the practice in a long-term way at home because if it was just about classes, like I would have stopped doing this a long time ago, probably, because it's not because you'll just stop. Like when you don't have the money to do it, you'll stop doing it. Or when you don't have the time to do it, you'll stop doing it. But you can find five to 10 minutes a day in your home. You can not like everyone can. And it seems like you can't. And honestly, if you have children, maybe you can't. I don't know what's going on in your life. But like, I feel like everyone's got an extra five to 10 minutes. And if you just focus on that, you can make it work. No, I think that is it's brilliant. It's very inspiring to me. I have this little nook area. And, you know, after reading, I'm like, you know, I'm going to lay out my yoga mat. And I like how you said, like, I was, I guess I imagined to keep it rolled up in the corner, but no, lay it out, keep it out there. It's kind of looking at you as like, hello, don't forget me in a gentle way. Exactly. And when it's rolled up, it's so hard. Like so many people will be like, yeah, I got my mat and I got my blocks and they've been sitting in the corner of my bedroom collecting dust for the last two years. And I'm like, I feel you do. You got to get it rolled up, present. Yeah, it's a thing. All right. Well, I know we have to wrap up. I, I want to end on one last quote. You don't have to embody anything other than your truest and most honest self in order to practice yoga. You don't have to emit the sadness, the anger, and all of the other ugly emotions that flavor our lives. You don't have to be anyone other than yourself. And I think it's high time that someone shouted it loud enough so everyone can hear. Jessamine, that is wise words for everyone. Thank you so, so much for writing this book and for everything you're doing for everybody and for coming into my life. Thank you for being in my life and thank you for the work that you do. And please, everything that I'm doing is only happening because we are all feeding off of one another and allowing the energy to flow. So thank you for being a part of that in my own life. And thank you for having me and congrats on body kindness. And please stay in touch. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. It was a pleasure talking to you as well. Become a Body Kindness Insider. Visit bodykindnessbook.com and click on Get Started.